Welcome back, geology fans. Dr. Arthur Bettis taught me most of what I know about glaciers and soil. Dr. Bettis would have no problem being called a quaternary geologist, and with pride. With many geologic explorations, we are going back, far back into geologic time. And yet, all around us, the very landforms and soil beneath our feet speak to us of more recent events that formed our earthly surroundings. Today we focus on that soil, and I will never forget how Dr. Bettis admonished us, it's dirt when it's on you, it's soil when it's in the ground. Don't call it dirt. Okay, in episode 46, we discuss the father of English geology and developer of the law of fossil succession, William Smith, and saw how he single-handedly mapped the geology and geologic structure of England, but he was mainly interested in the economic uses of the geology, mining, and groundwater for sure, but in particular agriculture. A prospectus proposing his plan of geologic mapping, written by Smith in 1801, begins, It cannot be necessary to use many words in pointing out to persons of judgment and discrimination the uses to which discoveries of the nature above alluded to, his title being Accurate Delineations and Descriptions of the Natural Order of Strata that are found in different parts of England and Wales, with practical observations thereon, so the uses to which these discoveries may be applied for what can be of greater importance in human science than a complete theory of the soil, which man is under a divine injunction to cultivate and replenish, that he may derive from that labor his daily subsistence. My specialty is in paleoclimatology, ancient climates. And ever since I learned about soils, when people ask me if I think climate change is the greatest environmental threat to the future of civilization, I say, no. I think it's soil erosion. When I spent time earning a PhD in Iowa, I learned that many parts of the state were losing three inches of soil per year due to bad farming practices. With contour plowing, no-till farming, and drip irrigation, some places only had a fraction of an inch loss per year. About five tons of soil per acre is created each year in Iowa, but the loss is 5.4 tons per acre per year. That's not sustainable. Well, there's more soil under that topsoil, which is often much worse for farming. Did you ever think that there might be more than one kind of soil, and that it could tell you something about the history of an area, the climate, and the geology below, and help continue to nourish you and your children into the hopefully distant future? In episode 31, our introduction to sedimentary rocks, we covered chemical and mechanical weathering. On Earth, the processes of chemical and mechanical weathering help turn parent rock into soil. On the Moon, we have mechanical weathering, and on Mars we have both mechanical and chemical weathering, so are these bodies also covered in a veneer of soil? No. Soil is specifically defined as being a mix of rock and mineral debris, organic matter, air, and water that can support plant growth. And I would argue the recent growth of seedlings in lunar dirt does not count as the plants petered out. In lunar dust, plant growth would only be sustained with added organic nutrients and, of course, water. On all of these celestial bodies, the surface minerals present will be both resistant minerals, left over after weathering of the parent rock, what are called primary minerals, and secondary minerals produced by the weathered products. The Moon and Mars have inorganic rock and mineral debris at their surfaces, which we do not call soil, no organics and no sustained plant growth. In those cases, the unconsolidated surface material is called regolith. And think of all you would need to add to Martian regolith to make it true potato-growing soil. But on our planet, volcanic islands and the very early Earth start with regolith, which must be able to change to soil over time. So whether we talk about regolith or soil, we need to look closely at weathering processes, particularly chemical weathering. If it helps you, one can also think of chemical weathering as decomposition and mechanical weathering as disintegration. 
The mechanical weathering we discussed sufficiently in episode 31, but to review, they include impact, frost and root wedging, thermal expansion, contraction, unloading, and salt wedging. And these will all be at play in making soil, with the main function of mechanical weathering being an increase in surface area, and serious increase in surface area as the larger rocks are broken down into the smallest pieces, clay is on these surfaces that chemical weathering does most of its work and ions are held for use in reactions or nutrients for plants. How fast the chemical weathering happens will be dependent not only on the climate and vegetation of the area but also the minerals being exposed to chemical weathering and the size of the particles. With experience, a geologist can get a feeling for how long a rock surface has been exposed to chemical weathering by the relative dissolution of the various minerals. If minerals are not very susceptible to chemical weathering, like quartz, then they often end up as residual minerals in the weathered mix. Other minerals, like feldspars, decompose into clays, and still other soluble minerals like calcite, salt, gypsum, or olivine will turn to soluble ions like carbonates, halides, sulfates, and silicates. In each case, the minerals are being driven toward a state of equilibrium with the surface environment. We saw in our metamorphic lectures that many minerals will overstep their reaction lines and would have to for them to exist at the surface of the earth, but this does mean that many deeply formed minerals are only metastable at the Earth's surface, and water is a very efficient way to weather these minerals back to equilibrium. Actually, it's super water that interacts with the minerals in rocks as it first falls through the atmosphere and picks up various soluble gases and insoluble particulate aerosols with CO2 to become carbonic acid and SO2 to become sulfuric acid. And so the average rainfall coming down in the modern world has a pH of 5.5. Remember, pH 7 is neutral, and lower numbers are more acidic. So this mildly acidic 5.5 pH rainwater meets the metabolic byproducts of decomposing microbes, eating mainly plants to produce fulvic and humic acids, resulting in the most acidic natural soil moisture with a pH of around 3. And that watery acid cocktail hits our minerals, and that's what begins the chemical weathering. Thus, an early earth with water, but no vegetation, would have an overall lower chemical weathering rate and even reduce mechanical weathering with less root wedging. A body like the moon, with no water nor vegetation nor significant atmosphere, basically has no chemical weathering and is dominated by the mechanical weathering mechanism of impact. But for most of Earth's history, we have had significant chemical weathering, driven mainly by slightly acidic water, and this chemical weathering in broadest terms usually involves the minerals grabbing hydrogen ions and or water, and in turn giving off mostly cations to the water solution. More specifically, chemical weathering can be broken into dissolution, mainly by carbonization, hydrolysis, and oxidation, but sometimes reduction too. First, dissolution. When a mineral interacts with water to completely dissolve and become solutes, as when halite, rock salt, dissolves into water to form dissolved ions of Na and Cl, that is dissolution. So any minerals directly soluble by water can totally weather away through dissolution, and the released ions are then moved on with the flowing water, which may ultimately precipitate those ions back out again. See episode 32, Chemical Sedimentary Rocks. A special type of dissolution takes place with carbonate rocks like limestones and dolomites. The CO2 dissolved in rainwater as carbonic acid directly attacks carbonate minerals like calcite through carbonization to create calcium or magnesium bicarbonate. And with these formulas we are taking our first peek at what is known as the bicarbonate system. With this first look we need to point out that three of the principal components of this bicarbonate system CO2, carbon dioxide, O2, oxygen, and CaCO3, the mineral calcite, being tied together through this system all have the surprising property of all dissolving better in cold water than warm water. 
Let me please repeat this very important point of Earth system science. CO2, O2, and CaCO3 all dissolve better in colder water. This means that very deep ocean water that's very cold or cold snow melt, glacial ice melt water, tends to be very effective at carbonation dissolution of carbonate rocks. Water can also attack minerals through hydration when water enters the crystal lattice and exerts internal pressures to aid the breakdown of the mineral. But our next subset in chemical weathering is how water can attack silicate and carbonate minerals through hydrolysis. Both carbonate and silicate minerals can react with the hydrogen from water and with the help of dissolution can alter mineral surfaces. This block represents a typical feldspar surface and on the water side we have dissociated hydrogen and hydroxyl ions. The hydrogen ion loves to join up with any exposed oxygen atoms on the surface whereas the hydroxyl loves to glom onto the metals like silicon or aluminum. A potassium ion may take off through our old friend dissolution to become potassium hydroxide, and its vacant space in the crystal lattice may be replaced with a hydrogen ion. By generally removing hydrogen ions from the aqueous side, such reactions raise the pH, that is, reduce the acidity of the water solution. And by adding the hydrogen ions to the crystal surface, the lattice can more easily be transformed into clay minerals. Feldspars tend to decompose into clay, mainly by hydrolysis. Next up, we have oxidation as an agent of chemical weathering. Really, we should say oxidation, removing electrons, and reduction, adding electrons, redox reactions. But in an oxidized surface world, at least above what is known as the groundwater table and not near high organic concentrations, we see more of the oxidation side of this. The name implies we usually remove electrons from the atoms in our sample because oxygen is taking them to fill the two empty slots in its outer electron shell. Here we need to take a look at the redox potential, the EH instead of the pH of the fluid weathering our minerals. Natural waters range in EH from negative 600, that's the reducing side, to positive 800, the oxidizing side in millivolts, with zero being no tendency to oxidize or reduce. But again, most surface environments are oxidizing, or the EH has a positive value usually. As we alter the EH of our water, we may find it hard to oxidize some ions like aluminum, and rather easy to alter other ones like iron. Manganese, titanium, and sulfur are other relatively easily oxidized ions. Iron is the fourth most abundant element in surface rocks and one of the more easily oxidized metals by the formula seen here, where our old friend the bicarbonate system pops up again as the two atoms of iron react with four molecules of bicarbonate and half an oxygen molecule and a couple of molecules of water and voila, you get rust, or hematite, Fe2O3, and release four molecules of carbonic acid back to the solution. Unlike dissolution or hydrolysis, oxidation can acidify water. Conversely, very acidic water can more easily put iron back into solution, so downstream from acid mine drainage, we often see the stream beds coated in rust. As the water slowly buffers and oxidizes, reducing the acidity and increasing the oxidation potential in a pattern called yellow boy. A clear sign, water was so acidic that iron has been dissolved upstream. With iron being rather soluble due to oxidation, reduced iron-rich minerals, those ferromagnesian minerals from the top of the Bowens reaction series, for example, are rather susceptible to oxidation weathering. Though many of the reduced compounds may be soluble, once oxidized they tend to become immobile, so that in mines we see the rock being exposed to air and the reduced minerals like pyrite quickly oxidize, and the reactive products like hematite, rust, or yellow jarosite sit right on the veins of pyrite that have been oxidized. Not very mobile, once oxidized and making secondary minerals. Mobility of atoms and compounds released by chemical weathering depends on quite a few factors, which can give us the various types and patterns we see in soil profiles, which is our topic next time, here 
on Earth Explorations.